the sedimentary lab usually involves a field trip and some hands-on working with sediments like um, sand and other rocks. But you've had a lot of looking at rocks and minerals in the last couple of labs. So I thought I would give you something a little different. And this share screen, here we go. And this is what uh, I found. It is, an Im I think they call it an immersive video, uh, virtual field trip. So an IVFT, that's what this is. But it's, um, this all revolves around looking at rocks in the Grand Canyon. And um, this, this first part is simply to kind of go look at a bunch of different things and there's videos and pictures and people, there are some geologists um, that basically they took a research trip down the Colorado River through the Grand Canyon and they stopped at various locations at beaches along the river and to look at the rocks. And there are a lot of sedimentary rocks in the Grand Canyon. The basement, the very bottom of the pile of rocks that's exposed there are metamorphic. Um, but the, the rest of the pile is uh, reflects different sea levels and so different environments over time. So whether the a sea had encroached upon the, uh, the continent or whether the, the ocean was retreating because sea level dropped, that kind of thing. And there are limestones and sandstones and shales and a nice, a nice variety. Anyway, so this is an, where you can go through and do that on your own just to look at it. And I really encourage it because I found it pretty fascinating that, you know, they have stops that aren't part of the lesson that I'll assign. This is one of them. I'll assign you the mystery of Blacktail Canyon. That's a good, relatively short um, virtual field trip. And then this one is also relatively short that talks about layers and superposition. I would have you do this part and the mystery of Blacktail Canyon first, and then ask you to just go explore a little more in, in this part of it. I mean, I'll just show you since it's here. And since I'm expecting more people so this is where you start and you can like rotate, look around, they've even got sounds, but it's really, it's high resolution images. So you can zoom in and see the rocks really closely. And they have like information things. Okay, this happens to be a picture of them uh, float or video of them floating down the Colorado they talk about the geology. Um, this shows you, let's see. Oh, that moved down river. This takes you down to their beach camp where they're talking about geology around the campfire or not. Um, but if you go this direction, they take a, a side trip down a canyon, a side canyon right in that notch right there and um, talk about different rock types like there's some basalt that has come down the river and they finally get to where they can see the source because there's no basalt anywhere. Uh, there is even some, there are some um, archeological sites up here where they found like corn, uh, that's the granary. Um, these little caves kind of either dug or natural, I think probably natural plus dug uh, caves where people lived. Uh, there's an Anasazi or the, the ancestors to the Anasazi. Anyway, they, um, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Anyway, oh, this is that side canyon. Um, they talk about all of that. And they talk about even like where a, the little Colorado comes in to meet the Colorado River and you see like there's a there's a color change in the water and they explain that it's really interesting stuff. So that's that's what I'd like you to do for the lab and um, there isn't a lot to complete for the lab because what you do is during the course of doing the virtual field trip 
in the black tail canon and the the layers and superposition one it it explains things and then it asks you to and you're supposed to explore and look more closely and then it asks you questions so you answer the questions and it actually keeps track of your responses it gives you a chance to like fix your answer if it's wrong um uh, and then at the end it'll give you a certificate of completion and so all I would ask you to do is to provide me with a screenshot of the certificate of completion for both those two parts of the field trip. And then I don't, there's nothing that you can submit for the, the ex, just exploring the Grand Canyon, that part. Um, so that's just for your benefit, really. And plus it's, it's interesting once you've learned more about the Grand Canyon before you start. So that's when the next one is going to be. I hope that uh, that'll be a nice change of pace and I hope you get a lot out of it too. It brings together aspects of sedimentary rocks and sedimentology that I'm going to talk about on Tuesday. It brings together um, some about some information about metamorphic rocks that I'm going to talk about today and that you dealt with in your or are dealing with in your lab right now. Um, and it also brings together geologic time because we remember we use the Grand Canyon as one of those places where you could see the law of superposition and how that's explained. So it's, it's really cool. And it also, you know, like they even talk about why some unit rock units form cliffs and why do others form like slopes instead of a cliff. And so you get to think about those kinds, kinds of things. I think you'll have fun with it. Um, I will write the instructions up and um, it'll probably just be like a one page sheet of instructions uh, that you can download or just look at online. And um, I'll give you a place to turn in your certificates. I have a question. Yeah, you bet. Um, this is the lab that's due this week, right? No, you, I haven't assigned this yet. Oh, okay, so I'm not as the the field trip. Yeah. No, I'm not going to assign that until next week. Oh, okay. The one you have right now is the igneous and metamorphic rocks. Yeah. Yeah, that's the one that's due at the end of this week. Okay. Because this week was shortened because I was sick on Tuesday. Um. I'm feeling much better, by the way, for people oh, okay. who don't know. I just started, <laughs> I started feeling normal yesterday. So I'm back to it's good to know. Thank you. I, it was a crappy feeling. So it's really nice to be feeling better. <laughs> um, anyway, so I haven't done this yet. I will, like I said, I'll put it together today. I'll get instructions and a place to submit your certificate of completion. Um, but that will be for next week. Okay. And it won't be due at the end of that week. You'll still have like, you'll have like two weeks to get it in. Um, but frankly, like the sooner you do it, the the better because it's the geology that we talk about in lecture is fresher in your mind, I think. Okay, um, why? Wait, that's my whole screen. That's not what I wanna share. Okay, this is what I want. There we go. Here we are. So any other questions before I get going and talking about metamorphic rocks today and metamorphism? No questions about the lab, anything? It's all going well. Um, I hope that uh, if you're, you know, if you're confused, I created the key last night and I realized that, um, for example, you have a bunch of boxes in the table where you answer, where you're going to identify the unknown mineral, metamorphic minerals. There are two of them, MX1A and MX2. Um, you're just identifying the mineral. Um, you could fill in some of the physical properties of the minerals in those extra boxes, but I don't ask you for that. I, you know, the box, the, the header is asking for in information about the, the metamorphic rocks, not the minerals. So it doesn't really make sense. Um, 
I've already revised it for the, a future lab, but um, all I'm saying is you don't need to fill out every single box on that table. Uh, for example, a lot of the rocks, there's one column you have for composition of the phenocris. Well, not all the rocks have phenocris. So if there are no phenocris, just, I just X that out, or you can put NA for not applicable uh, or just like strike it out so that you know that it's dealt with. Uh, there are definitely some rocks that you don't have in your mineral kits. So you won't be able to match them up from your mineral kit. So you'll have blank boxes at the very last column. Um, there are gonna be some rocks that are so fine grained that you can't identify any minerals. So those boxes won't have any information. Uh, so do you get what I'm saying? Um, so don't feel like you have to fill in every cell of every table. Yeah. The metamorphic rocks, I have filled in everything. Or well, okay, there's one not applicable, but um, those are mostly filled in. But the igne for the igneous rocks, there are a bunch of blank or not applicable boxes. And then the minerals have some blank boxes. Okay, if that helps, hopefully you weren't struggling with that. Um, you're not going to have a protolith. Wait, do you have a protolith for every? Let me just double check that. I think there is a protolith for every metamorphic rock that you have. Yes, the unknown protoliths match. There's one duplication. So one of the rocks matches to two of the, of the unknown metamorphic rocks. One of the protolith rocks matches to two of the metamorphic rocks, uh, but otherwise those are all filled in. And you actually do have a specimen of all of those metamorphic rocks in your rock kits at home. You do not have all of the examples. I said this already, I guess. You do not have an example of all the igneous rocks though. And you definitely don't have the metamorphic minerals in your kit, your mineral kit. Okay, so that's um, what to expect. Yes. Mary, I have a question. Go so um, the rock box that came with um, in the kit, not yep. the minerals, but the rocks, Gotcha. I don't I don't know what happened to it, but I seem to have misplaced the little list that shows, you know, the specimen numbers and what each I, is. Is it possible for you to post it? I am gonna give it to you right now because I'm gonna drop it in the chat box for you. Okay, thank you. Let me just put it here. There's the chat. There's chat. And let me find that form. Yeah, a few people said that they didn't get that list. Um, ideally, you'll be able to identify those rocks, at least, you know, like match them to other examples. Um, but I also want you to have the list because it was supposed to come with it. Okay. Da -da -da. Where did I put it? In this one? Mineral bank and rock kits. Okay, here it goes. I took a picture of both. I just dropped it in the chat. So grab that if you don't have your identification table. Okay, get rid of that. All right. Here Wait, I have another question about the lab. Go ahead. Um, so are we supposed to identify the unknown numbers for um, MX, the like the two MX ones? So you don't have minerals in your mineral kit to match those. No, no, the the proto protolith. Oh, the protolith. Um, yes, there are unknown protoliths on the same website, and so you're gonna go and look at those. And I I give you directions on how to find those. They're like at the bottom of another page. Yeah, but there's only four. Of there's only four of the protoliths, right? One matches to two of the metamorphic rocks. But there is one, two, three, four. And there are five metamorphic rocks. There's no rock protolith for a metamorphic mineral because the mineral is just a, it's just a mineral. But so there's, there's no seven. protolith for it. 
There are seven spots, though. There are five spots. AO1, AO2, AO3, AO4, and AO5. Those are the metamorphic rocks. You're going to look for the protoliths to match to the rocks. MX1A, MX2 are minerals. Oh. Individual okay. minerals, and those do not have a protolith. Oh, okay, okay. I get it now. Thank That's you. what I meant by just identify the minerals. You're going to visually match, and for one of them, there's a, there are a few physical properties that you can test on the site but otherwise it's just like visual you're going to see you know what you can see about the habit the crystal form the color the maybe the cleavage or the um the luster that kind of thing so you, for the mx one the protoliths are going to be blank x it out no okay. there's nothing there and there's not there's no sample number from your purchase kit either okay so you're going to have big old X's there. All I want, and in the instructions, what I say is just to identify the mineral, give me the mineral's name in the column that says identify any recognizable minerals. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, does that clarify the lab for everybody? So the protolis, there are four protolis, five metamorphic rocks. That means one of them matches to two of the metamorphic rocks. And then you'll be able to fill in all five spots. Um, and again, there are, I'm just checking. Um, there are not, in your rock kits, you have an example of all of the metamorphic rocks, but you don't have an example of all the igneous rocks, just some of them. So if there is no example of this, the same kind of rock, you're just going to exit out. Don't force anything, right? You, you want to make it feel co somewhat confident, at least, if not confident, about your, your answers. And if you don't, then it's probably because it doesn't correlate but you know send me a question if you get confused and given you know it would be helpful sometimes like to give me enough detail so that i understand and also you could send me a screenshot and like point to whatever it is that you're talking about or write a little note and put a sticky note on it with an arrow showing me what you're talking about and then i can just answer you quickly and, and help you like that okay Okay, any other questions before I dig in? Cool. Okay, so metamorphic rocks, these are my favorite. Um, we need to, okay, a couple of things. I'll show you <clears throat> your chap, the chapter on metamorphic rocks explains a lot of these things, the same things that I'm going to be talking about. It goes into somewhat more detail about like this index mineral thing. I'll mention that briefly today. Um, the metamorphic facies, I briefly mention it. I, I show you what a contact oriel is, but I don't talk about a, a lot of that. And I don't go into hydrothermal metamorphism or ores. So um, that part of the chapter doesn't relate, just so you know. Um, what is included in here, I'm going to define metamorphism for you first, and it's somewhat of a tricky concept. Um, I'll, I'm going to explain the three different kinds, three different trajectories on earth that you could follow to get different kinds of metamorphism. Um, contact metamorphism is around a, a, an igneous body, so it's high temperature. Regional metamorphism is what happens in collision zones where mountains are being built. And subduction zone metamorphism is particularly high pressure and relatively low temperature. So those differ in that way. And I'm going to go into each of those. I will talk about what metamorphic grade is and the facies, give you a little bit on the common mineral assemblages, just so you get the idea. Uh, we'll talk about protolis. Um, the there's usually a relationship between like a lot of metamorphic rocks also so show some kind of deformation um, because they're they're forming like regional metamorphism is in a, a continental collision so there's 
it's deforming ductally deep in the crust and it's deforming brittly in the uppermost crust while that's happening. Uh, subduction zone metamorphism the same, like things are moving and changing. So um, rocks get deformed. And then I'll, I'll explain a bit about how you name metamorphic rocks. Okay, so metamorphism is a solid state process. That means that the changes that you see in the rock, so you start off with your protolith, your initial proto meaning like the beginning, the initial start of the rock, what it started life as. It could have been, it, it could be anything. It could be a sedimentary rock. It could be any kind of igneous rock, or it could be another metamorphic rock that gets metamorphosed again. There is no melting taking place in this process. Metamorphism is solid. So that means, and it's usually temperature that helps the, the process along. It's the high temperatures that you achieve by being deeper in the earth that transforms these minerals, transforms one mineral to another. For example, biotite and plagioclase feldspar can the, the elements that constitute those two minerals are break down and they reassemble as a new mineral like garnet because when that happens the rocks have moved in the in the crust there they started off in one place where biotite and the plagioclase feldspar were kinetically happy. If you've taken chemistry, you maybe know about Gibbs free energy. It deals with like um, the stable, the stability of different minerals. So you, you want to have a Gibbs free energy that is the lowest, meaning that's the most stable form of your crystal. And if you're, if you started at in the upper crust, let's say as a sedimentary rock, but then that sedimentary rock gets caught up in a continental collision and it's buried 20 kilometers deep. It's gonna be a lot hotter at 20 kilometers deeper, but it's not melting. It's not hot enough to melt the rocks. It's just hot enough to metamorphose them. And that's where you get that process of like, you take the elemental constituents, rearrange them and put them in a new crystal that's stable that's happy that is it's it's known to exist at those pressure and temperature conditions so it's the pressure and temperature conditions that define what minerals we expect to see and the minerals that we expect to see depend on the chemical components of the original rock so if you started off with a sandstone that was pure quartz sand, then all you've got to work with is silicon, silicon and oxygen. So you, there's not much you can do to that rock except transform a sandstone to a quartzite. But if the rock is more complicated, like let's say you start off with a granite that has some pink potassium feldspars and some white plagioclase feldspars, some black biotite, some gray quartz, in it. So it's got four different consti con mineral constituents. Um, you take that to greater depth and well, you're going to see the growth of new minerals because those elements are going to, you might start seeing garnet form if the rocks have been buried deeply enough. Um, and then you would start maybe to see the texture of the rock change also. We'll talk about textural changes. So Metamorphism, the solid state process results in changes in the mineralogy. So that means the minerals that you find in the rock change, like I've been describing. So like the biotite and plagioclase might break down to form garnet. So that's a new mineralogy. Um, and you do that for multiple different minerals and you end up with a different rock, right? Um, and or the texture. But most of the time it's both, it's both mineralogy and the texture. So in the case of a sandstone transforming to quartzite, you get larger quartz grains. They start to grow together and, and interlock. Those crystals be 
become interlocking instead of separate grains that have pore spaces, open spaces in between. Um, and oftentimes there's also a chemical composition change, like new elements are added if you bring fluids in. And fluids are flowing throughout the crust. They can come from magma bodies somewhere. Fluids come off of that. Um, it might be groundwater circulating, um, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, so those fluids can heat up and when they're deeper also, and those fluids and temperature together can make a lot of changes to the, the rock composition, so the mineralogy specifically. Okay, so um, the metamorphism happens because of the physical and chemical changes at increased pressures and temperatures with the emphasis on temperature. Although pressure controls the, the mineral phase, the mineral that you get uh, in some cases. And um, so new minerals grow that are stable at those increased pressure and temperature conditions. I'm gonna be abbreviating pressure as P, capital P and temperature as capital T. So um, hopefully you will remember that as we go through this. Um, so this occurs deeper in the crust. So this is below where sediments are like on the surface and below where even sedimentary rocks form. So beneath where you would transform those sediments into rock. So go through the lithification process. Um, I'll discuss a bit of that. And um, Let's see. So deeper, it's beneath the region where you get have cementation, where the, the pore spaces fill up with, uh, it could be like a calcite cement or a silica cement that holds those grains together. And the compaction, so the weight of the overlying rock is, or sediments is compacting the rocks and the, the rocks that are beneath it. So there's, there's pressure and so those pore spaces collapse and the crystals start to grow together. And diagenesis takes place. So diagenesis is a term that's applied to um, helping, it, it's part, it, it describes the process of the rocks transforming, the sedimentary rocks actually forming the final stage of transforming into a rock from a sediment. And that is very similar to the idea of metamorphism. So diagenesis starts, at, well, I should do like this. So diagenesis starts from, you know, near the, in the upper crust, and then it gr starts to grade into metamorphism as temperature increases. And that happens usually around 100 or 150 degrees. I, I, that's on the next slide. Metamorphic rocks can coexist with partial melt. So if a metamorphic rock gets hot enough, um, it, it will start to melt. But when it melts, that's not a metamorphic process. The melting is an igneous process. So then you have coexisting metamorphic and igneous rocks. I'll show you some pictures of, of what a, uh, one of those rocks looks like. So um, please keep those, separate in your head that metamorphism is a solid state process. It's not melting. Okay, so the low temperature limit of metamorphism, like I said, grades into di diagenesis, the, the process of forming a sedimentary rock. Um, so they're, they're basically indistinguishable at that stage. It, metamorphism starts to take place um, at a, above or equal to 100 or 150 degrees C. And that's only for some minerals. So quartz and the feldspars will start to metamorphose first, just because they're more susceptible to at lower temperatures to, um, to those metamorphic processes. If you start, if, if your starting material was a basalt with no quartz in it at all, um, it would probably, metamorphism would probably start at a higher temperature 
um, maybe 200 to 300 degrees Celsius where the plagioclase feldspar or the calcium bearing plagioclase feldspar and hornblende starts to transform. So that's dependent on the chemistry of the rock or the original rock type, okay? Um, I like to, and I don't think I put this anywhere in the slide, but I like to um, describe metamorphism kind of like making a stew or if you like chili instead, whatever. But the ingredients that you put in the big stock pot for the stew or the chili that you're imagining, you're putting in, let's, let's imagine, okay, I'm thinking of the family stew. There was a family stew that my grandma used to make and it had potatoes and carrots and tomatoes and chunks of beef. Um, and I'm sure there was like water added and I, I actually don't know the recipe off the top of my head. There were spices, lots of pepper, some salt, um, some other stuff, chili powder, lots of chili powder. Those were all the ingredients for the stew. What comes out at the end, after you've cooked all those ingredients together, those ingredients don't look the same at the end. Your stew, the potatoes have changed. The carrots have changed. Their texture has changed. They've absorbed some of the fluids. So the, even the chemistry of the carrots and the potatoes have changed. So um, never mind. there's a liquid phase, that there's no liquid involved in metamorphism. But you get the, I hope you get the idea that the, the constituents, what you put in that stock pot is like what your starting materials are, what your protolith is. You can think of each of those ingredients as a chemical element, like calcium or silica or, or um, magnesium or iron or sodium or potassium, all of those things, and in different amounts, right? That's your protolith. What you get out at the other end, the metamorphic rock is like the finished stew. I hope that analogy works. There are a lot of food analogies in geology. Okay, so it totally depends the metamorphism and the process and what comes out at the end, the metamorphic rock that you get depends on what you started with. And then all you're adding is pressure, temperature, maybe a fluid that might have some chemistry to it. You know, if it's just water, you're adding hydrogen and oxygen. So it's relatively simple, or it might be some carbonate fluid or a silicic fluid. So it's got silica or it's got calcium carbonate, something like that. It's another chemical constituent. So this process starts and for an average continental crust that's about 30 kilometers thick, this starts around, metamorphism starts around four kilometers depth. So that's like two and a half miles or something down where you get about a hundred degrees Celsius. That's assuming a gradient, what's called a geothermal gradient um, geo being earth, thermal being heat. So it's the heat of the earth that increases as you get deeper. So that it assumes that the heat in the earth in this crust that we're taught, this hypothetical crust is increasing at 25 degrees Celsius for every kilometer down. That's how I calculated that. So there are some minerals like zeolites that are, and you're not gonna study zeolites. The scientists disagree whether they should be considered a diagenetic mineral or a metamorphic mineral. And so you find them in both piles if you were to separate these piles. Um, so it's kind of arbitrary where, like where you define metamorphism, okay? But if you're looking for hard and fast rules, here it is. Uh, it starts at 100 to 150 degrees Celsius um, for the quartz rocks. And that's about four kilometers depth where you get that. So four to six kilometers depth. So that's, in, that's still in the upper crust. If you were to break down a 30 kilometer thick chunk of continental crust, the upper crust is the top 10 kilometers. The middle is the second 10. 
the lower part would be 20 to 30 kilometers. So this is still taking place in the upper crust. Processes in the upper crust are still brittle. Um, and you don't see the ductile deformation that you see in a lot of metamorphic rocks. So um, you need to get at, you need to get to higher temperatures and deeper in the crust in order to see rocks like schists or gneisses. Okay, so the high temperature limit, so this is the low temperature limit. The high temperature limit of metamorphism is where it grades into melting. So where you start to melt those rocks. And that's if you remember Bowen's reaction series with, it went olivine, it was, I'll do it this way because it's on your left. Olivine at the highest, like 1200 degrees Celsius, then the pyroxenes and then the amphiboles. And this is crystallizing from a melt. Pyr or olivine, pyroxene, amphibole, amphibole biotite, then feldspar, K feldspar, quartz, muscovite, those minerals. And if you're talking about melting, so that was crystallization. If you're talking about melting, you want to start from the low temperature end and move upward in Bowen's reaction series. So the first minerals to melt would be quartz, muscovite, potassium feldspar, then biotite and plagioclase, then the amphibole, then pyroxene, then olivine. It works in that, just the same way, just in reverse. Okay, so this kind of rock where there's coexisting melt and metamorphic rock, it's called a migmatite, which basically means it's a mixed rock. And uh, here's a picture of a migmatite. So um, this is the metamorphic part of the rock. So it started off as, this is a gneiss, spelled G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. Um, you see the banding that is typical. So it's compositional banding where you've got the light layers and dark layers. Um, what happens during metamorphism is any minerals that are elongate, like, um, like a pyroxene crystal might be elongate or a hornblende or biotites have a flat structure, a sheet-like structure. Those can all rotate into alignment um, during deformation in metamorphism, like when this ductile deformation is happening to form this layering, those minerals rotate and then they become parallel with that layering. And that's when you get the separation of the dark minerals. So the pyroxene, the amphibole, the biotite in the dark layers, and then the quartz and the feldspar that are more rounded. They don't, they don't rotate in the same kind of way. Um, those form the light colored layers. That's how you get the banding. Um, and that only happens at fairly high grade metamorphism, meaning a grade of metamorphism. It means like when I say high grade metamorphism, I mean high pressures and temperatures. If I say low grade, I mean low pressures and temperatures. So low grade metamorphism would be maybe at the, in the middle crust or no, in the lower part of the upper crust. So closer to 10 kilometers depth or maybe 15 kilometers depth. Um, you're starting to move from upper crust to middle crust and getting more ductal processes. Okay. Um, when these rocks, if these rocks get high enough temperature, and that could come from simple, simply burying them deeper, um, you know, in this continental collision, there have to be some rocks that are in the lower crust. Um, or you could add heat from nearby um, Plutons, that's possible that intrude nearby. Um, but usually you get a different kind of metamorph metamorphism around a pluton. So we probably, just looking at this picture, we can assume it was just like in a mountain belt, in a continental collision, and uh, deeper in the crust. That's what we know about it. And looking at it, it probably had a chemistry like a granite. It's got, just looking at this, it's probably got quartz. The pink case bars are there. The white plagioclase feldspars are there. Um, I said case bar, didn't I? The, the, the pink potassium feldspars, that's what case bar is. Pink potassium feldspar, the white plagioclase feldspar, the, um, the quartz, and then biotite and maybe hornblende. 
um, maybe a little pyroxene. It doesn't have to be there, the pyroxene, but hornblende and biotite, I would guess, or amphibole and biotite is what I mean. So if you're thinking about melting a granitic rock, that chemistry, and you think about the bottom of Bowen's reaction series, the first minerals to melt should be, you know, moving upwards from like that 700, 800 degrees Celsius. You get quartz, potassium feldspar, and a sodic plagioclase, sodium bearing plagioclase that melt first. And look what's in the melt veins, potassium feldspar, plagioclase feldspar, and probably these grayish areas are the quartz right there and there, a little bit there. Um, so this is exactly what you would expect. If melting were to continue, eventually you'd start to melt the, the dark minerals too, but those have to be melting at a higher temperature just based on what we know about how these rocks work. Okay, so that's a migmatite. Um, so, uh, those, the melts are buoyant, they're always buoyant, so they can separate out of the rock and leave the rock as and form their own pluton, maybe, if there's enough melt. And they can also, these rocks can flow even, and all you need is like maybe 10 to 15 percent of the rock melting to coat the grains of the rock that are in the rock, and then it'll, it'll ductily flow, not like a liquid, but toward that, getting there. Um, melting actually is gonna start somewhere around 700, 800 degrees C, the bottom of Bones reaction series, where the quartz and the, K and the potassium feldspar start to melt. Questions about this? Okay, let me know if you've got questions. So, um, I was mentioning a geothermal gradient. Um, here's the definition down here. Geothermal gradient is the rate that temperature increases with depth in Earth's interior. So in continental, like normal continental crust, like in the middle of the continent, so away from collision zones, away from subduction, uh, subduction zones and plutons, it might be 25 to 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer. So if, um, if continental crust is 30 kilometers thick, what temperature are the rocks at the base of the crust? Assuming, let's assume, um, let's assume 30 degrees Celsius per kilometer in this area. And we've got 30 kilometer thick crust. What temperature are the rocks at the base of the, of the crust? Um, you mean at the 30 kilometers deep? Yeah. Um, I think 900 degrees Celsius. Yes, 900 degrees. That's exactly how you do it. Um, you want to figure out what temperature rocks are supposed to be. Uh, that means that, that it's stable and things aren't in changing. They're not in flux. So yeah you would expect the base of the crust to be around 900 degrees Celsius. Um, and oftentimes people describe the lowest part of the crust as being mafic, probably because at those temperatures, some of the, the con mineral constituents of those rocks have melted and, and left the system, left the rock. So maybe the quartz and the potassium feldspars are out of there or there aren't any at all. And you're just left with a composition that's closer to um, gabbro. Gabbro is the plutonic equivalent of a basalt, right? But we expect something, we don't expect a volcanic rock to be down at those depths. I'm just talking about the chemistry of it or, or even a plutonic rock. You would expect a metamorphic rock with that composition. So maybe a gabroic gneiss is how you would say it, instead of a granitic gneiss, a gabroic gneiss. Um, <clears throat> okay, so that's like an, a normal geothermal gradient, like 30 degrees C per kilometer. That's described by this middle arrow. Um, if you're 
near the edges of the continent. So you're in an area where there's a lot of volcanism and plutonism. So magma, magmas, there's a lot of magma, um, volcanoes are erupting or, uh, and the plutons are feeding those volcanoes <clears throat> are in the middle crust or upper crust even. They've made their way through the crust towards the, the upper crust where they can be erupted. Um, those rocks <clears throat> would have a different trajectory, <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> they would have a high temperature and maybe a, a lower pressure metamorphic path. So they would fall, follow a geothermal gradient. That The arrows are gradients. And so I'm, we're describing a geothermal gradient with these arrows. So a high temperature, low pressure path would look like this. And that's typical of contact metamorphism. I would ignore the regional right now because that, that would apply here actually. It's in, it's in another diagram that I put together to explain this to you. <clears throat> um, this blue path describes um, high pressure, low temperature. So pressure is increasing a lot faster than temperature is, kind of the inverse of this high temperature, low pressure one. The blue arrow follows a path that is like a subducted slab of crust. So subducted oceanic crust would follow a high pressure, low temperature metamorphism path. And depending on your geothermal gradient, you're gonna get different mineral assemblages. So different groups of minerals will grow because they're stable at one along one of these paths. So at high temperatures, but relatively low pressures or at medium pressures and temperatures or <clears throat> at high temperatures, but medium pressures or high pressures and low temperatures. They all exist somewhere in earth. Um, well, not the extreme pressures, nothing that would go down this edge and nothing that would go down this edge. Um, so in between these arrows. All right. And, you know, you would probably stop this, this um, plot at a thousand degrees Celsius. So hopefully beyond the temperature, the base of the crust. So the melting is going to come in here at some point. Um, yeah. And pressure just keeps going because you can go on down into the mantle and keep describing the pressure increase. Temperature is typically the most important factor in metamorphism. Fluids are also very important. The, some rocks can heat up to the right temperatures and not transform until a fluid comes along. So it's not quite as simple as saying, oh yeah, these rocks were at these pressures and temperatures, therefore we should have this mineral assemblage. Well, maybe not. Sometimes they hang on to their, their lower pressure or lower temperature minerals a little longer until they stabilize at those pressure and temperature conditions. I'm going into this too much. Do you have questions about this so far? I'm gonna be more specific in a minute. Okay, so temperature is important. Temperature has several effects on rocks. It promotes recrystallization and that leads to an increased grain size. So if you were to start with a limestone um, with small calcite crystals in it, um, so calcium carbonate, if you metamorphose that rock and there's a limestone and you can't really see any crystals in it, right? I don't see any, it just kind of looks uniformly brown. Um, that's because the crystals are small. Here's a marble. Those crystals have become rather large calcite crystals because they've grown together and grown larger because of mostly temperature that that rock has been um, uh, subjected to. Um, the temperature drives a lot of these reactions. So um, they, those reactions take up the heat. They use the heat to transform the, the temperature, the heat. It's the, the temperature is a, a measure of heat, right? The heat is what actually drives the reaction. And 
it's it's like it pushes, it gets it over a kinetic barrier that might stop some reactions from taking place. So that's what it means to like drive these reactions. It's the chemical kinetics. I was talking about Gibbs free energy earlier, that kind of idea. So um, to do in, you know, in my college uh, chemistry class, and if you're not a science major, you probably don't take chemistry in college, but you should have had it in high school. Um, you might have looked at reactions and balanced them and then looked up, uh, you know, Gibbs free energy or entropy values or thermal capaci capacity, like a, a lot of different components of those, you know, whatever, whatever molecules you're dealing with and calculated which way a reaction should go. Should the reaction be driven to the left, to the starting conditions, lower pressure and temperature minerals, or does it point to the right and it moves to its new um, pressure and temperature set of minerals? Hopefully that- Question? Yeah. So since the reactions are endothermic and they're absorbing heat and it says overcomes kinetic barriers, I assume that means that because it's absorbing the heat, the kinetic energy in the rocks um, or the uh, protolus is going to increase because um, the increased temperature will make the molecules move more. So the kinetic energy increases, is that correct? That's true, yes. Okay. Absolutely, that's part of what comes into play here, yeah. <clears throat> so in this picture, these are some optical, these are petrographic microscopes. So it's a polarizing microscope. And so PPL means it's plain light. This is just what it, a thin slice of this rock looks like under an optical microscope. And the XPL means they put in the polarizer. It's like polarizing sunglasses. It filters out. Um, so you're only getting one direction of light. And um, that allows you to see some additional optical properties of minerals. And what you see here is, um, I'm going to guess at what this is. It looks like it might have been an amphibole in the center. It's like a tannish or a pinkish color amphibole. And around it, do you see this rim of green? So what this is, is showing you that this mineral has started to break down and to form a new mineral around its edges. It's if you add the matrix mineral, like this might be plagioclase, to the the horn blend, the, the amphibole on the inside. If you have a reaction between those two, you would grow this green mineral. So that's like the product of that reaction, but it's incomplete. So it the whole mineral hasn't transformed. It started from the outside, and it's going to work its way to the inside. And if it was subjected to those metamorphic conditions for long enough, or if a fluid came through to help drive the reaction further or faster, then you might have transformed the rock completely. But this is like a, a chemical reaction, a mineralogic reaction, rather a metamorphic reaction caught in action. Um, it's like a snapshot of that process there. Actually, it looks like there's a different mineral here in the XPL. It looks like maybe, well, I can't tell from it, this is too small and it's not enough information. But do you understand the idea what I'm saying? That you, your chemo, you get a transformation that the minerals can break down and you break down some components like plagioclase plus biotite to give you garnet. This is similar, except that this is, um, the breakdown, the reverse, taking that, the product, like in this case, if it was an amphibole and then adding the plagioclase to make, or taking those components, breaking them down and forming plagioclase plus the, the green mineral, which is probably chlorite, which is another mica. It's a, it's a green kind of micaceous mineral. Okay. I, I'm going to keep explaining this. We're going to talk about this for a while. So um, I'm not done yet. Um, pressure is also important. P 
pressure increases with depth because the load of the overlying rock gets greater as you go deeper. So there's more and more rock on top of you. So the pressure, the confining pressure that it's called a lithostatic pressure, the pressure that the rocks are at um, just increases with depth. Um, but you can kind of, yeah, mess with, uh, you can perturb or change those conditions, change that normal geothermal gradient um, through tectonic processes or, mag, you know, igneous processes. So in the case of high temperature, low pressure geotherms, those are areas where you have magmatism, or it might be an in a tectonic sense, could be an area where continental rifting is taking place. So go back here, I'm talking about this arrow. So con contact with a pluton or a rifting environment. Um, a subduction zone is where you have high pressure, low temperature geotherms. And so that's gonna change what you expect to see in a, a, a typical continental geotherm. So you, you no longer have this normal geothermal gradient. You've got a high pressure, low temperature gradient in a subduction zone. Okay, so pressure can determine what phase, which mineral, I should say mineral. I, I use phase in my, it's, it's kind of like a chemist way of talking about minerals. Um, it just means mineral in this case. Silimonite, that mineral, I've got a picture here. They're usually like little long elongate crystals that are kind of yellowish or brownish in this case. Those are happy. So this is a, a phase diagram or a, the stability diagram, let's call it, um, where it's, it's one mineral, or sorry, it's one chemistry. This, these minerals, kyanite, andalusite, and silimonite all have the same chemistry. They're all Al2SiO5. That's what they're made of. But those, the aluminum and the, the silica is put together crystallographically differently, um, whether you're at high temperatures and lowish pressures where you would get andalusite, or at high temperatures where silimonite is stable, and at high pressures, kyanite is stable. Remember that one? This is the one that I wear around my neck a lot. That's the blue kyanite. Um, so if you were to take, you might start off, um, well, I don't have the right arrow to show this, but anyway, you would move from conditions like this to conditions where kyanite is stable. So it could be a line like this where you're just cooling the rock. You would move from the silimonite field to the kyanite field of stability um, at lower temperatures, but at the same pressures. So you would replace the silimonite with kyanite. Or I put this, this arrow on here, this rounded path, it's, it's a clockwise path is a path that rocks follow in subduction zones, or it's close to um, also regional metamorphism. So in collision zones, in mountain belts, in the deeper crust. So they, they get, they get hot, they get buried. So they get hotter and they're also being buried. So the pressure increases and they're being metamorphosed they reach their highest pressures first, then they reach the highest temperatures. Metamorphism could be continuous or it might form, uh, the metamorphism might take place here and it might happen again here at highest temperature conditions. And it might even happen again here. And that it could be punctuated in that way as the rocks move through the crust because the rocks aren't really transforming forming themselves continuously it's when the rock kind of catches up to its, because it's in motion, it's moving through the crust, it, whether it catches up and stabilizes at those pressure and temperature conditions. And because you get partial reactions like these pictures imply, like a partial metamorphic reaction, um, you, you often can see evidence of this clockwise path. So you might have evidence of kyanite having been there once and then silimonite 
growing over it. And then maybe Andalusite replacing the Solomonite. I've never seen it like that, but I definitely have worked on rocks where you see two phases. So one overprinting the other. All right, so in this case, so here's a typical subduction zone. It's an ocean continent collision zone that we looked at already plenty of times. Um, you would get the high temperature metamorphism around plutons. You would get medium pressures and temperatures just in, in the mountains where the crust is thicker, where it's thickened. Um, that's where you bury rocks more deeply than they had been. Um, you could, you know, if it's a cooled pluton, well, actually the, see the purple rim around each of these? I think that's implying contact metamorphism. That's what it's called, contact metamorphism, contact with a pluton. Those are the high temperatures. And then around those, away from the heat of the plutons, it's just typical geothermal gradient um, pressures and temperatures that you're dealing with. And metamorphism can take place there. So away from the plutons, but in the thickened crust. The third place is in the subducting oceanic crust, really. Uh, I. I, I haven't seen metamorphism of the the actual like um, crustal lithosphere, lithospheric mantle. Um, but this subducting oceanic crust moves down. Those are earthquakes, but and it gets down here. You see the dewatering. We've been talking about um, flux melting. So the melting, the water coming off of this. So you might come down and it might be metamorphosed at blue schist facies conditions. This is one of the, I'll, I'll get to that. It, a blue amphibole grows. Um, and it's a pretty, it's not blue blue, like the kyanite is blue, but it's still, it's a bluish hue to the rock. And if you ever see big crystals of that mineral, it's pretty and dark, deep blue, sometimes violet. But anyway, those amphiboles are stable partway down this subducting slab. You get to deeper conditions, you move from a blueschist facies to an eclogite facies that I'll show you. Um, and eclogite mostly has pyroxene and garnet in it, no amphiboles at all, no uh, or very few micaceous, it might have a little bit of muscovite in it. But um, the hydrous minerals are mostly gone because they've been transformed into anhydrous minerals like pyroxene and garnet. Where'd the water go? Up into the, 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 blah. It's been too long since I last gave my lecture. Into the mantle wedge where they um, help partial melting of the mantle wedge. So that's where the water goes. Um, meanwhile, these rocks are being subjected to higher and higher pressures and the pressure increases faster than the temperature does. And I'll explain why in a minute. So those are three different environments and three different kinds of metamorphism. <clears throat> okay, so I put this figure together to explain kind of how the geothermal gradients inter like work with the idea of metamorphic grade. So this is, and, and also with those facies that I've been talking about. So low grade metamorphism means that it's at low pressures and temperatures. So I would describe it sort of in this area of the diagram and we're going to 40 kilometers deep. So if this was in a collision zone, 40 kilometers isn't that deep. That's probably in the lower crust at that point but it's not to the mantle yet. Um, if you're down at the lower crust, it should be a high grade metamorphism, whether it's high pressures, low temperatures, or kind of both high temperatures and high pressures or just high temperatures and low pressures. And then in between it's medium grade or intermediate grade, if you like. And then this red dash curve is the line where melting would start. So on the right hand side of the diagram is where you would find migmatites, those mixed rocks that have both melt and the metamorphic rock. The rock doesn't melt completely, like it doesn't snap over and suddenly it's liquid, right? We start by melting the quartz and the potassium feldspars, maybe the biotites and the amphiboles, and you work your way up, up Bowen's reaction series. 
So this is the idea of metamorphic grade. It is a broad generalization. Um, and in fact, at 100, I said metamorphism doesn't even start until 100 degrees C, 150. So this area right in here, this corner, is not metamorphism at all. Those are rocks that have not yet been buried deeply enough. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. Here are those same geothermal gradients, okay? And this is how I would like you to refer to them. This, the high temperature, low pressure trajectory or geothermal gradient is where you find contact metamorphism. That's the contact with the pluton, okay? That's where the heat comes from. This trajectory, the black line, is where you get subduction zone metamorphism. So in that oceanic crust, so blue schist and then eclogite facies somewhere along here. But um, the pressures, it gets deeper faster than it gets, the temperature increases. So the pressure increases faster than, temp than it heats up. And then in between the, gr the green field is sort of a range of, and honestly, it should be the, whole, the entire range across this entire diagram. But I'm trying to show that in the center, like at moderate temperatures and pressures, you you, that's where you get the regional metamorphism. And the regional metamorphism is everywhere else in the mountain belt, you know, away from the plutons. That's where the regional metamorphism is taking place. Um, so this is kind of the, the range of what you would, of the, con, the typical metamorphic con conditions you find in nature in the crust. Uh, your book goes into more detail. I thought I would just kind of skim over this just a little bit. Um, I've only got three slides to kind of cover regional metamorphism, but I wanted to at least bring up the idea of Barovian metamorphism, that is one type of regional metamorphism. And it, it was discovered by a guy named Barrow in Scotland. Uh, that's the next slide. But it's, it was in an ancient mountain belt in Scotland where he recognized a sequence of minerals that appeared in this area. In fact, let me go here and just show you the map. Okay, so here is Scotland. The rest of England is down there. There's Edinburgh and Glasgow. And up here near Aberdeen, um, along the coast, and I went here and did this so I know exactly what it looks like. It, you cannot, okay, let me say this first. So he walked along the beach and he, there's a, a range of rocks that are exposed along the coast. And what he did, he must have taken samples. He must have hammered off samples of these rocks and cut those thin slices and looked at thin slices under the microscope to see this because the, the crystals are not big enough to see with your naked eye for sure. I think I saw garnet, tiny, tiny little garnets, but the other minerals it was really hard to find. They're really fine grained metamorphic rocks. Um, so he had to have looked down a microscope to figure this out. But what he saw was he went from the an area where there was chlorite. And then he saw the chlorite switch to biotite. And then biotite was replaced with garnet. And then you saw andalusite and then kyanite and then silimonite. Those are those three minerals I just uh, talked about, the Al2SiO5, that phase diagram. So he saw the sequence and what that represented is on here. So this is, this is Barovian metamorphism in here. Those index minerals, the chlorite, biotite, garnet, starlight, or yeah, I said andalusite. That, um, if it's at lower pressures, you get andalusite. But starlight, kyanite, silimonite, these are index minerals. There are other minerals in the rock, but it's like, you know, it's like quartz and maybe some plagioclase and maybe some muscovite, but those are just like hanging out. They're, they're not telling you much about the pressure and temperature conditions that the rocks were subjected to. Um, to know that, um, yeah, I've got to close this because I can't keep track of time here. How do I get rid of you guys? Um, there we go. Okay. Um, so, oh, 
I got to talk faster. Okay. So he, uh, there are other minerals there, but it was the, these indicator minerals, these index minerals like indicate something about increasing, increasing metamorphic grade. So with increasing pressures and temperatures, you saw progression from a green chlorite to a black biotite to red garnets to brown starlights to blue kyanite to yellow selenite. The color is not important. I'm just, just explaining. Um, and it's the appearance of a new mineral because in the biotite zone, you don't necessarily lose all the chlorite and you don't necessarily lose both of those when you get to the garnet zone. It's the appearance of the new mineral that tells you you've reached these new conditions. So that's what Barrow did in, in sort of defining that. And those are those index minerals that I was talking about. <clears throat> okay, so this is a sequence of, of these regional metamorphic zones. So those index minerals define zones within. And don't worry about memorizing these or this order. I'm not gonna ask you to replicate, like tell me chlorite, biotite, garnet stuff. I'm not gonna ask you for this. I'm just explaining that we use the index minerals to tell us that. So this might be, oh, plitic means like a shale. Uh, here, I'll just say shales are politic. Um, i.e. there you go or slates um, might produce uh, rocks in the chloride zone biotite same idea um, they might be slates though that you find the biotites in and then with increasing metamorphic grade those transform the slates transform to schists where garnets are growing um, then you might see the starlight but you see there are other minerals in there. Those, those other minerals just don't tell you anything important. Um, and then on and on. Uh, eventually you get into high enough grade where you've got gneisses um, and schists. Those are the highest sort of, those are the form of metamorphic rock you find at highest grades. Um, I work on gneisses a lot and schists. Uh, in fact, I have a, my license plate says nice on it. <laughs> um, only one S though, two S's and three S's was were taken. Anyway, um, that's what he discovered. And then we he started to put together this idea of metamorphic facies and, and all this. So slate, or rather I described slate, slate starting off at lower grades, then you grade into a phyllite where the micas start to grow larger and then you get into schists and then nices and then eventually when you cross the melting path you get it you have a migmatite a mixed rock so that's sort of a progression of the rock types that describe the textures um and the the colored fields in the background i was i mentioned blue schist facies and eclogite facies that's a those are subduction zone rocks those are high pressure low temperature um, rocks or where those are the high pressure, low temperature conditions where you find those rocks. And some rocks you actually name blue schist, that's a blue schist and that's an eclogite. It's not just um, a field that describes. So you can describe a rock as an eclogite or you can describe a range of pressures and temperatures where eclogite facies metamorphism takes place. So that's what the facies is all about. It means this range of pressures and temperatures. So um, yeah, I think I'll leave it there because I don't expect you to remember all of these. I just want you to know about some of the rock names <clears throat> too. Okay, subduction zone metamorphism, I was already describing as like oceanic crust coming down. You start off with basalts and gabbros. So it's like a mafic composition. And you know, with high pressures and temperatures, you're getting, um, Blue, that blue amphibole is a sodium bearing amphibole that gives you the blue schist facies, or if the rock is right, you'd call it an actual blue schist. Um, at higher pressure conditions, you get eclogite facies that's known for the pyroxene on the garnet. It's like, a, we call it the, like a Christmas rock because it's green and red. The pyroxene is green, the garnets are red. And how we dehydrate the rock. So we squeeze the water out or metamorphic process processes squeeze the water out and then that leads to partial melting in the in the mantle wedge. 
I wanted to, to compare that to this. So this, these are isotherms in the earth. So um, line, these yellow lines are lines of equal, actually it's the red lines, red lines. There's that line follows a path where the temperature is 200 degrees in the crust. So what you see is, okay, you're hanging out sort of lower middle crust. And then in the subduction zone, you drag down that 200 degree isotherm into the subduction zone. So it pulls cooler isotherms down into it. So my PhD advisor always described that he was funny. He is funny, he's still around. He's 80, he's 88 now. He's gonna be, oh my God, he's gonna be 89. Is that right? It must be, he's gonna be 89 in December. Holy moly, I gotta say hi to him. Anyway, um, subducting crust, he, he basically was one of the guys who invented subduction zone metamorphism, like figured it out when plate tectonics was starting out. Um, he's known for studying these rocks and those group of, of professors down there at Stanford. He talked about it as describing its cool with it. So the, the cool crust, oceanic crust that had been at the surface is subducted down. It drags those isotherms and it brings the cool, because you can have warmth, why not cool, right? So it drags the cool down into the mantle. Um, and you see even that the cooler isotherms are around the subducting slab. And so the slab is a little bit insulated as well as it goes down into the mantle. It stays cooler than it should be for its depth, okay? So that's why it has a high pressure, low temperature um, profile or geothermal gradient. Oh, I'm not gonna make it today, oh no. All right, I'll figure out a way to get around this. I might have to post, I think in order to catch up, I might have to finish this lecture asynchronously and post it separately. Um, I think that might be the best thing to do. Anyway, let's talk, just finish what we can. Um, so here's contact metamorphism and the minerals that you might find, low pressure metamorphism. So these assume a mafic protolith, so like a basalt or a gabbro and the minerals that you might get. So a green schist facies, it's named for the green minerals that grow in green schist facies. That chlorite that was growing, that green rim around that partially reacted mineral, that was probably chlorite. That's green, epidote is green. Um, uh, the amphibolite facies is where amphiboles grow. It makes sense. So you get hornblende, that's the amphibole. Granulite facies, um, it's mostly pyroxene and plagioclase. Sometimes garnet, rarely quartz actually. Mostly pyroxene, garnet maybe, plagioclase. But eclogite facies or blue schist facies, subduction zone, high pressure, low temperature. You get um, the glaucophane is that blue amphibole and then um, hence blue schist facies and eclogite is the green pyroxene and the red garnet. And I just wanted to show like how the mineral, mineral assemblages are very different for this, a similar kind of protolith or same protolith, you would get different minerals depending on the PT conditions the rock was subjected to. I really like this diagram and I had to just share it with you because we've been talking about subduction. And I really like this because it shows how messy the subduction zone really is. And in, this doesn't really convey all the messiness that I believe is down there. I think there are a lot of faults, brittle faults, and a lot of folding and ductile, um, ductile processes flow happening as you heat these rocks up, as you bring them down the subduction zone. Um, there are fluids involved in transforming the mantle wedge into serpentinite from um, a green serpentinite. That's one of the Franciscan complex rocks that you can find on 280. Everywhere there's a little landslide on 280, it's usually serpentinite um, or there are blobs of serpentinite hanging out, sticking out. Um, but, so this shows the alteration in the mantle above the subducting oceanic crust. And it just shows like chunks, like chunks of um, sedimentary material that got taken down the su subduction zone and chunks of the serpentinite that's all in there and 
This is oceanic mafic crust. So there's basaltic crust in here. Um, and it's a mess. And some pieces can break off the subducting slab, probably along a fault of some kind. And because they're buoyant, the rock is actually buoyant compared to the mantle. And it's all based on densities. Um, the, they're a lot less dense, especially if it's full of serpentinite. That's really low density, relatively low density. It and it's got flu fluids in it, so it's that helps it be buoyant. But um, it comes back up the subduction zone, those slices, and that's often where we find the these rocks at the surface where we can study them, because slices break off and they come right back up the subduction zone, and we find them at the point where the ocean and continent have collided. That's where they come back up and that's where you find them. So anywhere you look, if you look at a geologic map of the world, anywhere you see serpentinites, it's probably a subduction zone, an ancient subduction zone. And serpentinite is usually, um, our ultramafic rocks are colored purple, a deep purple. So anywhere you see purple on a geologic map, it probably points to subduction zone continental collision. Here's Ring Mountain I keep talking about. So there's the Golden Gate Bridge. Here's Mar Marin Headlands. You drive up here along 101 and then take, I think it's Paradise Valley or Paradise Drive and exit and you go down the, follow the road until you come up and there's a residential neighborhood that you can park up at the top. There's an entrance that takes you to the other side of this mountain on that bridge side. And once you're up on the hill, this is what you see. Um, exposures of blue schist, eclogite, amphibolite. There are mantle rocks in places like this far hill over by that water tower. At the tops of these hills, you find peroxinites that are partially serpentinized. So a little bit of serpentinite, a little bit of peroxinite. You find chert and some of the um, like sandy protolith, materials like uh they're called gray wackies it's not it's not a great name but it, like a set of uh, sandstone protolith but the interesting thing really is the peroxinite and the blucious eclogite amphibolite because you rarely get to see those kinds of rocks and it's not far away and i i wish i could take you guys so i encourage you to look up ring mountain this is an a, a, an open space preserve so it's a park that you can look up and there's another really easy, the closer place to park, there's a church on this side. So if you exit earlier um, and come up the south side entrance, there's a church parking lot you can park at and the trail takes you right to this, this area and you'll get straight to the Blucius. Okay, so that's a, that melange, that's the mixture of these rocks that come back up the subduction zone. It's just a mess. Okay, I wanna move on to uh, contact metamorphism. This occurs around igneous intrusions. So I should say plutonic, right? So magma, there is heat involved with those intrusions and fluids. So both the heat and the fluids help to metamorphose the surrounding rock. That's where the contact metamorphism comes into place. Um, it can happen over a wider range of pressures. So this can happen deeper in the crust, but oftentimes we see relatively low pressure conditions reflected by the mineral assemblages. Um, the, the region around the pluton is called the contact aureole. This is what it looks like. So here's a pluton. Here's some protoliths, we'll call them. So sedimentary protolith, sandstone, a sandy shale, a shale, a limestone, another shale. This pluton comes in and provides heat and fluids. What do you get? You start off getting a fine grain, what's called a hornfels. That's just a generic name for a fine grain contact metamorphic rock. You can't see a lot in it, honestly. Um, and then the, the zones of at lower temperature zones farther away from the pluton, you would see different assemblages. Um, at the lowest temperatures, you might see muscovite and chlorite growing in the shales um, or biotite and andalusite. That's the Al2SiO5 phase right there. But if you're dealing with limestone as a protolith, 
um, you're gonna get marbles, a coarser marble closer to it, a finer grain marble away from the heat source. And a sandstone, <clears throat> if it's relatively pure quartz, you'll get a quartzite. So just like the lime, going from limestone to marble means you go from fine grain to coarse grain, same thing with the sandstone. You would see small uh, quartz crystals that are not, that still have poor open spaces in between them. A quartzite is denser. The crystals have grown together into an interlocking crystal structure and they grow larger. Does that make sense to everybody? So this doesn't, the metamorphic aureole doesn't spread out indef infinitely, right? It, the heat dies off at some point. So it's just the area around the pluton. So if we go back to a, a, a diagram like this, I used a different diagram this time. I thought this might be a little clearer. The contact metamorphism is around the plutons. It is not the pluton itself, right? It's around the rock surrounding the pluton that's subjected to all this heat. The regional metamorphism is taking place in the thickened, deformed crust in the mountain belts because you can't achieve those high pressures and temperatures without some thickened crust. And then subduction zone metamorphism is along this purple arrow. So moving down the um, subducting oceanic crust. Hopefully that's clear. Um, so just to think about protoliths a little bit more, and this might help you with your labs too. Um, the, I, I've said that the metamorphic mineral assemblages that you get are a function of the pressure and temperature conditions and also the chemistry of your protolith rock. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so different protoliths will give you different mineral assemblages, even at the same pressure and temperature conditions. Ex for example, you start off with a granitic protolith. You have high silica, sodium, potassium, and aluminum. You know, that are those are the building blocks of quartz and feldspars right there, and maybe some micas like muscovite. Sandstones are nearly pure silica, so it won't grow ex anything except quartz or bigger quartz crystals. Same with the carbonates, it's mostly calcium carbonate. Sometimes there's magnesium in there, which gives you a dolomite instead of a, a marble, or yeah, a dolomite. But if it's pure calcium carbonate, you're just moving from a limestone to a marble. If you start off with a shale, so finer grained, more clay component, it's a smaller crystal, mineral crystals, um, and higher aluminum, much higher aluminum goes into that kind of product. But a fine grained shale will give you aluminum, potassium, silica. A mafic protolith like a basalt or a gabbro would, it's high iron, magnesium, calcium. Ultramafic, so if you start off with a mantle protolith, like the peroxonites that are at Ring Mountain, they bring a lot of magnesium, iron, nickel, and chromium. And high magnesium, that will get you serpentinite real quick and altering it. Okay, so I hope that that helps a little bit. Um, I wanna talk about the deformation a little bit. Let me, let me get as far as Let me get at least to naming uh, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss for you, okay? So give me another 10 minutes and I'll be done. Promise I'll stop. Okay, let's talk deformation first. So I said these rocks are usually part of a collision zone, a continental collision zone. So there's deformation going on as well as uh, metamorphism. So this, for example, this would be deformation of um, a styrofoam cup that was taken to 600 meters depth in a submersible and subjected to the confining pressure of all of the, the ocean water around it. At those pressures, it shrunk, it compacted 
the, the cup. That's exactly what happens to the minerals that are stable at higher pressures. They, they regroup, those elements regroup and rebond. They reorganize themselves into more dense um, orientations and you get a different mineral often. Okay, a couple of things. Let's just talk about how the ways that you can deform a rock. Here's an undeformed block. If you undergo brittle deformation, you would fault the block. So in the uppermost crust, where it's cool in the crust, that's where you would get faulting or breaking. But deeper down, after you, it's called, there's a brittle ductile transition in the crust where it gets hot enough. And that probably happens, it depends on the chemistry again, 300 to 500 degrees Celsius, let's say you get, you start to get ductile deformation. So rocks can be stretched, they can be compressed, they can be subjected to shear. And that's what I've tried to show down here with this cube. So here's a cube and I put a round, let's call it a quartz grain. There's a crystal of quartz, it's perfectly round um, in this cube. If you subject it to confining pressure like just the surrounding rocks at a given spot in the crust or like this cup in the submersible. Um, it's even equal pressure from all sides. Um, but if you change that, if you disturb that in a tectonic environment, it could be a rifting zone where you would get tension or a collision zone where you get compression or a shear zone where it's just, it's not a uniform um, or it's at some angle to the crystal. This is how you would deform that grain. With tension, you would stretch it. With compression, you would squeeze it. With shear, it, it's gonna have sort of a, an offset sort of look. I don't know how to describe this very well, but you're getting, it's like, it's like faulting, but in a ductile rock. So, um, Imagine this kind of situation, but where the rock is just deforming along the fault, you would get something that looks like this. That's what shear would do. Shear is like faulting, but in ductile rocks. Okay, so those are the different ways you can do it. Here's what happens in the rocks. So a foliation can form like this. See this banding, this is a nice, and you get a planar feature that's called a foliation. So you could put your hands parallel to the surface of this rock that would be parallel to these bands, compositional bands. And that foliation happens when you've got pressure from above and below and you're squeezing the rock. Everyone agree that that's what it should look like? If you squeeze a ductile rock, it should form this, this kind of banding. If you stretch a rock, and this one is stretched and not squeezed so much, Look at this. These are just stretched out like straws. I've got another picture to show this. It's just remarkable, this outcrop. It's been stretched ductily. And these look like pencils or straws or something where there's no foliation developed. It hasn't been squeezed like this. It's been pulled and stretched. Um, or you can have both. You can have a combination of a foliation and a lineation. So linea these are lineations. This is a line that is formed, a linear feature. This is a planar feature, the foliation. So you see the foliation here going around the rock and there's a lineation up at the top in the plane of the foliation. That's how you look at the lineation. You look in the same plane. So that surface is in the same plane as the foliation. Those are little lineations that are like these guys. So that just depends on the stresses that are applied to the rock. What happens in the rock is the resulting strain that's recorded. Here's another example, one of these lineated rocks. And it reminds me of like a bundle of straws. You see the points of at the ends of these elongate crystals. They're long like this and you see the ends right there, just like this drawing. So I like that example. I wanted to share that with you. <clears throat> um, hmm. I thought I was going to take this one out. I'll just, depending, yeah, this is a nice one. This used to be a conglomerate. 
um, with a bunch of like cobbles that are like maybe fist sized uh, rocks or pebbles. And these have been stretched. This is called a stretched pebble conglomerate. It's a metamorphic rock, but each of those pebbles that maybe once was spherical have been now stretched and they don't look spherical anymore. I have an example of that in my class too. That's awesome. The pancakes are describing, if you just squeezed, if all you did was squeeze and it wasn't any kind of shearing, you would get pancakes instead of these stretched pebbles. You would have pancake pebbles. <laughs> I guess, yeah, the, these are more like, I don't know, cigars. Who thinks of cigars anymore? That's what I was, the example I used when I was taught. Okay. If you start off with an original sedimentary bedding, this is an example of a shale. Here's some sedimentary bedding, all laid down horizontal, just like you learned about um, original horizontality. That's the protolith, the shale is the protolith. And this is an example of increasing metamorphic grade, increasing metamorphic grade going down, starting off with a shale protolith. The first thing that would happen is a foliation would develop and you would get a foliation that is not necessarily parallel to the bedding. So in this case, the stresses, the compressive stresses are coming in this direction and a foliation forms like this. So all the elongate minerals or platy minerals are aligned like that in that foliation plane. If you keep going, you would start growing coarse micas. So you would start off, so somewhere between the slates and the schists, you'd have an intermediate part where the muscovites start or the micas start to grow, but they're too small to see and that would be a phyllite in here. But once the, the micas are grown large enough to actually see with your naked eye, they lay down on the foliation plane too. So you would see big muscovite, let's use an ex as an example, following this foliation. Um, and you would call it a schist at that point when you can see the large micas. Um, and then at higher grade, you would separate the minerals into the lighter minerals and the darker minerals. Often what that means is the darker minerals are ones that are planar or elongate, like a, a pencil or something like that. They just, you know, they have a long axis. All of those, the planar minerals and the long axis minerals, they rotate into the foliation plane, like this suggests. And then the quartz and feldspar form the rest because they don't have a preferred orientation. They don't, they're not gonna rotate like that. They don't have a long axis. So they fill in the rest and you get a compositional banding in what's called a nice. I should have highlighted the nice with one of my colors. Where is my color? There we go. So banding in nices, coarse micas in schists, um, just the foliation plane, a, a fine foliation um, in slates. Now, um, at pretty high temperatures, you would get like to a granulite facies condi conditions, high temperatures, relatively high pressures, you lose any amphiboles, you lose any micas because the temperatures are too high. In which case you start to get a coarser grained um, texture, maybe with some large minerals like garnets growing in the matrix. So you see changes with progressive, uh, progressing increase in grade. Okay, take that same shale, here's a shale, and follow that same increasing grade. So increasing metamorph, oh, I should have said, met oh, that's part of the, the thing. It's not, I can't edit it. So increasing metamorphic grade is what I would have written here instead. Um, you see first slate with the foliation developed, that's this plane. It's, it's, I need to see it on edge to show you the foliation, but it's this edge that's flat. That's the foliation. It's nice and flat and planar. We use slate for chalkboards, right? It's nice and flat. A phyllite is the next stage where it, you, the rock, the slate, it still has a foliation. Maybe it's not as fine, but you see it's got a sheen to it. It's shiny. That's because tiny 
muscovites or tiny micas have started to grow and you're seeing the light reflect off of their cleavage face. Um, but you can't see the actual micas yet. They're too small. You just see a sheen. That's when you have a phyllite. That's the name of this metamorphic rock, a slate. And then these are, this is metamorphic, this is metamorphic. The schist is next in line. That's when the micas have grown large enough that you can actually see them with your naked eye. So these shiny spots on here, that's the foliation plane again. They're laying down parallel, the micas are laying down parallel to the foliation plane so that you can see the light shining off of the cleavage faces and you can see them aligned in that foliation plane too. At the highest grade, you would get a nice, and that's where you get the compositional banding with the mafic minerals in the dark bands. Those are the elongate and planar minerals that rotate. Oops. And the lighter feldspars and quartz uh, minerals in the light bands. This is how you name these four names, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss, are the name of any metamorphic rock that has a foliation. If you see any planar feature at all, you're going to give it one of these names, slate, phyllite, schist, or gneiss. If there is no foliation, then you give it a different kind of name, and I'll get to that in just a moment. But I'll, I'll just re-emphasize a couple of things with just a few slides. I know I'm, I'll be done in 15 after. Okay, here's a slate. See, it's not shiny, right? Not shiny at all. See how the phyllite is shiny? That's the sheen that we're talking about. That's because there are small muscovites. I should have said muscovite here instead of phyllosilicates are sheet silicates. I'll change that for the future. The sheen indicates the growth of those micas. That's the next stage. So first slate with a foliation, then a phyllite with a sheen. Next is visible muscovites or vis visible micas. They're there, you can see them. You know, if we could zoom in or use the hand lens, you could see the actual muscovites, but they're large. And we've also developed a, a course, these are garnets have grown within it. It's a new phase that showed up um, with increasing usually with higher pressures, garnet, garnet's happy at higher pressures. So this rock, I wouldn't just call it a schist. The, the, the coarse micas make it a schist and not a phyllite. Um, with the coarse micas, you call it a schist, but that's really not enough. You should add more, something to tell about its chemistry to be more specific. And so you would give it a name like garnet mica schist because you're saying, hey, there's a prominent large mineral here, garnet, and there's a lot of mica. So garnet mica schist, that's how you would name that rock appropriately. Um, the next up is a nice and any rock, and it doesn't have to be white and black bands. I've seen nices that like eclogite facies nices with green and red bands, green pyroxenes, red garnets, even blue um, glaucophanes, that blue uh, sodium, sodic amphibole. I've seen red, green, and blue stripes. So it doesn't have to be white and black. This is just like proto a granitic, probably a granitic pro protolith. Could be a shaley protolith, but more like a granitic protolith um, is where you get this kind of banding. Okay. I would call this, instead of just nice, I would say it's a granitic nice. Um, because it has similar mineralogy to a granite. If you're able to add a term like that, to add, to say granitic nice, if it was all dark, you might see say it's a mafic nice, it's something to tell what kind of nice it is. You know, if you come across a rock that has anything distinctive about it, maybe it's a biotite instead of muscovite, then you would say a garnet biotite schist. If there was no garnet, maybe just say biotite schist or mica schist. So that's how you name those foliated metamorphic rocks. So all the, these three slides, slate, phyllite, schist, and gneiss are the four kinds of foliated metamorphic rocks. Non-foliated rocks, um, I'm just gonna show you a couple examples. Um, these two, 
are tip typically names that you give to contact metamorphic rocks, but there's no foliation in these. If it's a fine grained contact metamorphic rock, it gets the name Hornfels. You're not gonna have any of those, so don't worry about it. If it's a coarse grained metamorphic rock that you really, it's, it doesn't get a special name like quartzite or marble, then you would just call it a granophels. You might say something about like, I had a, a kyanite granophels that I use in one of my labs and it's kind of bluish. It's kind, mostly kyanite and quartz, but you ignore the quartz and you say, ah, the kyanite is distinctive. So you say kyanite granophels. Um, you probably won't have to use those terms too much. These two you will. So you should know that a metamorphosed limestone or a calcite bearing rock is going to give you a marble. That's one of these specific or special metamorphic rock types. If you start off with a sandy, like a sandstone that's full of quartz, you get a quartzite. I've mentioned this is the this is the last one. I'll stop. Um, serpentinite I've mentioned before. Here's what a serpentinite looks like. It's kind of green. That's the mineral serpentine that's growing in there. You get these where you've altered or metamorphosed ultramafic rocks, um, usually with by the addition of fluids because serpentine is a hydrous mineral and there's not a lot of water in the, in the mantle. Um, I, I wanted to talk about non-foliated rocks. So I'm not even gonna talk about the granulite right now. So I just gave you five examples of non-foliated rocks. So hornfels, granophels, marble, quartzite, serpentinite. There are a few examples. So um, if you don't know anything about its composition, only use its grain size and name it a hornfels or granophels if it's coarse. Hornfels if it's fine, coarse, granophels. If, it, if you know something about its composition or you can see something about it, you know maybe this has a hardness of seven, so it scratches a glass plate, well, it's probably quartzite. It's probably quartz in it. If it fizzes, it's probably formed with calcite and you're looking at a marble. Okay, so that's how I want you to handle those. I'm done talking. I didn't mean to keep you so long, sorry about that, but thank you for your attention. Um, does anybody have any questions? I do. Okay, go for it. So um, it's kind of going back into earlier in the lecture, okay. but um, about um, like partial melting and chemical composition and recrystallization. Where should I so, go? Um, I, I mean, you don't have to go back to the slides. It's just okay. a general question about those concepts together. But um, when partial melting occurs and with recrystallization um does like what happens with the partial melting do any like minerals that are present like um go into like dissolution and like go back into their ions and then like switch places with the they other ones that are present to recrystallize into new minerals so metamorphism could continue um, even beyond this, this curve. This is the curve where you, you would start melting a granite, but it's just the start. So you would start, you basically you would melt the quartz and you would have a liquid phase that coexists with solid rock. And so the, the quartz now, if that's liquid, it's gonna be in a, a little vein or maybe a dike or something like that. And it's gonna be a little stringer that doesn't have rhyme or reason to where it goes. It follows a crack or it follows you know, some easy path in the rock. It doesn't necessarily have <laughs> to interact with the metamorphic rock anymore. Mm -hmm. um, but you could, uh, does that answer your question? What maybe you could ask again now that I've said that? Um, is that so what I guess you part of it I was asking um, is like, let's say that there's a mineral present that um, has like magnesium in it, and there's another one present with aluminum, and then okay. one with iron. Um, if okay, partial melting occurs, 
can they like re um, arrange like substitute for um, each other in order to change the composition of the metamorphic rock as they recrystallize? Okay. Like I, the melt doesn't won't interact once it's separated. Um, and so you would actually literally start to, for example, if it was a garnet that you were melting, mm -hmm. that's an iron and magnesium bearing phase. So that's going to happen at higher temperatures. Uh -huh. uh, the, you would start to melt it and, you know, it, it would be partially melted. You would take away from the outside of the garnet first and it would get smaller and smaller until it was completely melted. But then uh -huh. all of, all of those ions are, are now in the liquid. So if you were to measure the composition of the liquid, it would have a garnet chemistry if that's all that was in it. Um, uh -huh. But by that point, you ought to have melted the chlorate and the biotite and the quartz and any and the feldspar. So your liquid at that point would be full of silica and aluminum and like a, many different constituents. And then that can go, once it's a, a melt, that can move or crystallize into an igneous rock. And if it's, mm -hmm. at the, it's usually beneath the surface, those don't usually erupt to magmatites. They're pretty deep in the crust. Those would just crystallize somewhere else as an igneous rock. They no longer interact with those solid phase minerals, but oh, the, okay. the metamorphism, so the solid minerals they could, they're still subjected to high pressures and high temperatures. They could still continue changing and metamorphosing, but um, only with what's left in the solid phase. It won't uh -huh. interact with the melt. Melt's gone. Oh, okay. So my question, I guess, was kind of more related to igneous processes then than metamorphic. I see. Yeah, it sounds okay. like it. Yeah. Okay. So keep them I see. separate. Metamorphism is always and only solid state. Once liquid is involved, you're talking an igneous rock. Okay, I think I was confused by the partial melting. Well, I mean, yeah. Uh, think of the partial melting as having rock plus liquid. Um, okay. And whatever partially melted is in the liquid now. But as soon yeah. as it's in the liquid, as soon as that's liquid, that's igneous. And okay. whatever's left in the rock, the solid phase, that is subject to solid state processes uh -huh. until it melts too. Okay. Okay. So yeah, it might never that answers melt. my question. Yeah. So it's only uh -huh. some rocks that would undergo this in the crust. It's not a given that they're going to melt. Many rocks go down these paths, they get subducted and they follow these paths. They never intersect that curve. And so we just see evidence of solid state metamorphism at different pressures and temperature conditions. Mm -hmm. No melt at all. Okay. Okay, I know it's tricky. That's why I said it right at the beginning. It's tricky. So um, hopefully that helps you to distinguish the two processes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Mary. You're welcome. Have a nice weekend. You too. Any other questions? Uh, I just had a quick one. So basically, uh, last week's lab, I kind of just realized now that um, I messed up. <laughs> the, because, the igneous metamorphic one? Uh, the minerals one. The minerals one. Okay. So I, messed up? So um, on the sample number for the purchase mineral kit, I actually use a list that was provided like the A, A0, A01 is one. And then I kind of went down throughout that list rather than actually using the mineral list. I don't get it. Um, Did you use the unknowns online? No, no, no. Can I share my screen real quick? Yeah, yeah. Let me, I got to switch something. No worries. Um, nah, nah, nah. Okay, here we go. I got to stop sharing this and I need to do that. Okay, go for it. Um, perfect. So... Um, here it is. So for, he, for here on this, rather than using the actual sample numbers from the, from the purchase mineral kit, I used, I corrected it now, but I used these, 
like one for, for the A01. Oh, but that's identified already in the left column. Yeah, so that's kind of what I realized. Oh, well, submit now. a revision. Just, I haven't graded those yet. Just okay, submit perfect. another one. Okay, no, all right, thank you so much. And then uh, I had a quick question. If I couldn't find the minerals on, um, like are all the minerals supposed to be from our kit? No. Okay, that just just making sure. All right, thank no, you so I, much. Yeah, no, some will you won't be able to find a match. Okay, perfect. That's that's all. Good. Thank you so much. All right, you're welcome. Have, yeah, have a good day. Bye, Thanks Mary. Bye.